The, the Christmas series, this Advent Christmas series is called Christmas Light. And the whole idea of Christmas light is it could easily be thought we, that we're talking about the lights because our season is known for light, right? Christmas is all about decorations and light, and we love the lights. In fact, as I was walking out of the, the campus on Wednesday after the upper grades Christmas program, I, I stopped because I was thinking about all the trees that were lit up and wrapped with lights and so forth. And so I took this picture looking back into the campus. Isn't that cool? And then, of course, I, I saw the tree and I thought, well, you know what? I may as well get a really good shot of the Christmas tree, and so there it is. Doesn't that look nice at night? I mean, it just comes to life in a beautiful way. Well, the thing is, as much as I love and you love Christmas lights, the series isn't Christmas lights, it's Christmas light. And the reason for that is because in addition to lights at Christmas, the season also has lots of other stuff that goes along with it, and some of it is not so fun. In fact, some of it's really burdensome and difficult, and it can weigh us down. And so the, the idea is that, that we're going to look at some of those things. Like last weekend, we talked about when your calendar goes crazy, when your schedule is out of control, because it happens to all of us during this holiday season. We're going to look at some of those difficult parts and figure out, as we look at the gospel, how God can help to make our Christmas light, not burdened, not heavy, not painful, to make it light. And so that's the whole idea of Christmas light. And where we're going to go today, we're going to talk about when your debt is deep. You know, it's interesting. I quoted this statistic last weekend. 46% of Americans, now get this, 46% of Americans said in a survey they just as soon skip the Christmas season altogether because it's so difficult. And remember, a big part of that is that they feel pressure. They feel burden because of, of financial responsibilities to, to either buy or give gifts and, and the resulting consequences. In fact, I, I looked at an article. There's an article that talks about the ways to avoid holiday financial stress. It sounded like a good article to read heading into this sermon, but the thing is, the article is just a little suspect in my mind because the very first way to avoid financial stress in the holiday season is know your credit score. That sounds a way, like a way to financial disaster in the holiday season, doesn't it? Because the temptation when it comes to buying and giving gifts is to use that magic plastic card that we've got and, and rack up more expenses than we actually can pay. You know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe you can buy, you can afford all of the, the presents you want to give this year. But whatever your circumstance financially, we all have debt. Some of it is financial debt. Some of it's personal debt, the kind of debt where, where we owe someone something. You know, they've done something for us. We owe them something in return. Some of us have relational debt, the kind of debt that requires an I'm sorry, an apology, or the kind of relational debt that where we've done something, it's way beyond an apology. That relationship is already broken. It's already fractured. We already are, are separated from somebody that we care about or a friend that we love because of something we've done. We also have spiritual debt. When I say spiritual debt, it's, it's, I'm talking about the, the reality of guilt and shame, the burden that we all, all too often have in our hearts and our lives because we know we've made mistakes. We know that we've done things wrong. We know that, that when it comes to God, we haven't lived the way we're supposed to be living. And so the, the thing comes down like this. We have this, this sin problem. And I can't tell you how many times I've preached the, the message of the gospel, how many times we've talked about God's love and his forgiveness for, for all of us, and yet still from time to time I'll talk to people who will say, you know what, I believe in the gospel. I believe in God's grace and forgiveness through Jesus, but I just don't know if God can forgive me. Sometimes that spiritual debt can be crushing, and so what we want to talk about today is, is this song of Mary, the Magnificat, and we want to talk about how that speaks to the ability of our God to make our debt, even though it's deep, to make our burden light. So to get our, our minds wrapped around this story, we've got this young woman, Mary, and the angel comes to her, and the angel says, you're going to have a baby. Now, 
that's great news. She's going to have a baby, but it's really bad news because Mary is betrothed. She's not married. And that means there are going to be all kinds of consequences within her culture and within her family. She's going to be scorned. There's going to be ridicule and, and judgment and shame applied to her. And so you get the sense that Mary realizes all of this, and while she's willing to do whatever God wants her to do, she, she decides that she's going to get away from her family, and she's going to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth is a little bit older, actually quite a bit older, but you get the feeling that Elizabeth is maybe a confidant for her, right? A, a person that she can go to, a person who's always loved her and accepted her and, and will, will stick by her no matter what. So she goes, and the very first person that Mary's going to tell about this baby that she's going to have is her cousin Elizabeth. Thing is, she doesn't get to tell her. Now, I'll get back to that in a minute, but, you know, I have to tell you, it's sort of an interesting thing how women can share when they become pregnant, in fact, I remember when Julie was expecting Katie, and uh, she called me one afternoon, and her voice was kind of bubbly and excited, and, and she said, guess what? I'm thinking, what's the most outlandish thing that I could possibly say in response to guess what? So I said, ah, you're pregnant. She says, yep. I said, what? <laughs> no way. Last weekend one of our beloved couples shared with me on the way out. They said, oh, pastor, we were hoping you'd be on our side for communion today because we're expecting again. And what she's talking about is the fact that on this, uh, years ago, when they were first married, they had come forward, and this, this young lady's been part of the congregation for a long time, since she was a girl. And uh, she's come forward. I've given her communion probably hundreds of times. But on this one particular day, she came forward. And as she came forward, she pointed to the grape juice. After I've always given her the wine. And so I kind of raised my eyebrows like, huh? She got this big smile. <laughs> and after the service, we celebrated that she was expecting. Well, Mary doesn't get to do any of that. Because Mary arrives at her cousin Elizabeth's house, and as soon as the baby inside Elizabeth's womb, the baby that's going to be John the Baptist, as soon as he hears Mary's voice, it says he leaps inside of her. And Elizabeth knew. She knew exactly what was going on. And so Mary, Mary in this conversation, breaks into what we call Mary's song or the Magnificat. It literally says that she says these words, but it's beautiful nonetheless. My soul praises the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed, because the Mighty One has done great things for me, and his name is holy. You just sense Mary is just, just overwhelmed with praise for God. And you notice she says those two things I mentioned in the children's message. Number one, that God is great. My soul praises the greatness of the Lord. That's a theme all throughout the scripture, that God is great and he is mighty and he is awesome. In Deuteronomy it says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, mighty, and awe-inspiring God. In 1 Chronicles, the Lord is great and highly praised. He's feared above all gods. Throughout Scripture, it talks about the fact that God is awesome and God is great. But you know, if that's all, then you and I have a problem. You know, this last week, as our country mourned the passing of President Bush, there were all kinds of tributes and all kinds of comments, and people shared personal interactions that they'd had with the president. And one of the ones that, that jumped out at me was one by Pastor Larry Kruger. Pastor Kruger used to be a pastor here at Concordia. And on Facebook, he posted an account. If you remember, Pastor Kruger now is serving in Waco. But before he came to Concordia, some years before, he had been campus pastor at, in College Station at A&M. And during his time there, the, the college suffered that tremendous tragedy, the collapse of the bonfire. And Larry had talked about many times about how significant and what a, what a mark in his life that had left. But he shared the story that, that while there was a number of people gathered and they were in a staging room doing all of the things and making all the preparations and notifications that needed to be made following that tragedy, that President Bush had walked into the room 
And when he arrived, he went around to each and every person individually, making an expression of condolence and sympathy to every single person in that room and sharing his sadness at what had happened. And it was cool because Larry said, you know, I had always respected him as president and commander-in-chief, but I went from respecting him for his office to respecting him for the person that he was. Mary speaks about God's greatness, but then she moves seamlessly to talk about the fact that God is gracious. She says, he has looked with favor. This mighty, awesome God has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. She's amazed that this awesome, powerful God would actually even know her name, would be focused on a humble person like her. You know, this last week, I was talking with one of the young men in our congregation, and he was talking about the fact he's, he's sort of sorting out some things about his career, and he's been involved in, in the retail marketplace, and, and he's thinking about moving into management, and he was sort of talking that through. And one of the things I'd ask is, you know, have you seen lots of different leadership styles? Do you feel like you've sort of seen different management styles that you can emulate? And he said, yeah, I've had seven different managers over the course of, of the few years he's been in retail. And he said it's interesting because some managers are are amazing, they're great at organization, but they they stay in their office and they really don't ever interact with the people on the floor, but but things run smoothly behind the scenes. And he said then there are other kinds of managers, and they're on the floor all the time, they should probably spend more time in the back, so everybody loves them, but but there's sometimes hiccups in the behind the scenes stuff. And what he's talking about is the the difference between a boss that, that is approachable versus not so approachable. To realize when it comes to our God, our God isn't just approachable. Our God is approaching us. Our God sees our circumstance, He sees our condition, and He doesn't stand off. He doesn't simply say to us, hey, just come to me when you need something. Our God literally sees our condition and sees the desperate need of our souls, and He comes, He approaches us. Why does He do that? Because you and I have debts. We have debts that we can never possibly repay, and God is here to help. This is how he's going to help. Mary goes on. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He's done a mighty deed with his arm. He's scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He's toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You know, isn't it interesting So that last part can be a little bit confusing. But think about it this way. So you and I and and all human beings have a tendency. We rank one another right away, don't we? Every culture, literally every gathering, every group of people, we end up putting people in order. We sort it out sort of automatically. Who's the top dog? You know, who's on charge? Who's the most powerful? Who's whatever? All the way down to the most lowly. And then we figure out where we are in that stratosphere. The thing is, God doesn't look at it that way. Mary doesn't say, we have this mighty God who is gracious and he helps lowly people rise through the ranks to become powerful people. She doesn't say, we have this God who sees poor people and he helps them become wealthy so that they can rise to the top. She doesn't say anything like that. In fact, literally what she says is that he turns the whole thing upside down. I love in the book of Acts in chapter 17, Paul and Silas are preaching in Thessalonica, and some of the people in Thessalonica become irritated with them, and they become jealous of them. And literally, their complaint is this, these men who have turned the world upside down. What they don't realize is that Paul and Silas are turning their world upside down, but it's not Paul and Silas. It's the gospel. It's the message that they're delivering to the people about God's love and his power and what his gospel does that's turning the whole thing upside down. So think about it this way. Do you remember the last time you looked at a, at a swarm of ants? Or maybe even a, a stream of ants that were carrying something or moving something. Maybe you just saw it on a video. But you remember when you looked at that bunch of ants and you looked down and you thought to yourself, hmm, well, there he is. There's the big dog for that group over here. <laughs> oh, and here's, this, is the, this has got to be the boss over on this side. 
Oh, look at that one. That dude has got some good clothes. That's a seriously well-dressed ant. And this guy, this guy, do you see the living space he just can't? It's amazing. Of course you didn't. Right? We don't look at ants. We see a group of ants. We see ants. We don't see the differences. Now, there are differences. There are distinctions among the ants. But the reality is we look at ants and we don't see any of that because they are so far beneath us that unless you're passionate about it, you don't pay any attention. Dear friends, between our God and us, there's no comparison. And while God knows us and he created us and he knit us together and he has a masterpiece life plan for us, it would be foolish for God to think about who's rich and who's powerful compared to who's not because compared to God, none of us are wealthy and none of us are powerful. All of us are broken and all of us are debtors desperately in need of forgiveness. That's why Jesus prays in the Lord's Prayer when he's teaching us how to pray at the, at the heart and center of the Lord's Prayer is that, is that sentence that says what? Forgive us our Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That you and I are in desperate need of help with our debt. So here's what I want to do. I want to spend these last few minutes and I want to share three points that have to do with the truth about our debt. Okay, you ready? Point number one, sin creates debt. Sin creates debt. It's not what God designed. God didn't plan it into the system. Adam and Eve were in the garden and they had no debt whatsoever. They were living under God's grace and favor just as he had created them and lo and behold, the devil came along in the form of the serpent and he tempted them into sin. And with their sin, with their rebellion against God's law, God's rules, sin entered the world. And, and this sin creates separation from God. The thing is, it's powerful. It, it, it runs rampant in our lives. It's not just something we do. It's something that literally affects our nature, what we think about and how we behave. And it's kind of like that situation where Somebody does something for you and, and you say, hey man, I owe you one. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Except every time you and I sin. So every word that is, that is sinful is we owe it. Every thought, every action, every sinful attitude, every time we sin, we owe a debt because of it. And the thing is, it's not like we can just say, uh-oh, we're racking up too much debt. We're getting too much sin credit going on. We need to cut back because it's part of our nature, and literally, we struggle to, to even break free. Remember what Paul says in Romans? The good things that I know I'm supposed to do, the way I'm supposed to live, I can't get there. And the bad stuff, the sin that I'm supposed to avoid and, and stay away from, I'm, I'm constantly being pulled back to it. Wretched man, broken, sinful man that I am, who can deliver me? Sin creates debt. Point number two. Because sin steals from us. Sin creates debt. Point number two, because sin always steals from us. Here's the crazy thing. Sin makes all kinds of promises, doesn't it? Sin looks so attractive and it looks so alluring and it, and it looks like it's going to give us what we want. It looks like it's the shortcut to, to, to joy and happiness and peace and whatever else, but it is always a lie. It always cheats us. It always takes something away. Remember the story of David? We talked about David and Bathsheba just a few weeks ago. Remember David is powerful. He's wealthy. In the human strata, right, in our way of measuring, David was at the top of the heap. And he's out on the rooftop of his, of his home one night, and he looks down and he sees Bathsheba, and, and he's tempted by that. He, he believes that if he could just have her as his wife, if he could just have her for a relationship, that, that it would make everything wonderful. And he falls. And that fall causes him not only to betray his own well-being, causes him to compromise this woman, causes him to betray his friend, causes him to betray his nation. And the reality is what, that when David is finally confronted by the prophet Nathan, he is so broken, he is so distraught that he prays a prayer. And do you remember what the prayer is? 
Restore the joy of your salvation to me. Dear friends, one of the things that sin steals from us is our joy. It promises joy, but it doesn't bring it. It steals us. That's why David says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Second thing that sin steals from us, the reason why it causes, it creates debt, it steals our peace. You know, it it promises that if we can just have this, if we can just cut this corner, we can have peace, We we can be relaxed, we can have what we want, we won't have to worry about anything anymore. But the scripture in Isaiah 48 tells us the truth. There is no peace for the wicked. There's no peace for people who sin and cut corners to get there. Because what happens? Well, number one, you're always looking over your shoulder, right? You've been there. We've done that, all of us, right? Where we, we did something we thought nobody knew, but even though we thought nobody knew, we're always kind of looking over our shoulder wondering when it's going to come out, wondering when we're going to be caught. And even if we're, we're sort of callous and we cover our tracks and we, we are certain nobody's going to find out, do you realize every time, every sin carries with it the consequence of guilt and shame. And we may avoid that guilt and that shame for a period of time, but the reality is it takes a toll. It weighs down on our hearts and on our lives. But maybe worst of all, so sin steals our joy, steals our peace, Worst of all, it steals our hope. You and I desperately need hope. And sin doesn't give it to us. It promises, it says, you know, that if we just do something, we'll have something. But the thing is, it's always a lie. And so sin doesn't, doesn't give us hope. It steals hope. And it steals hope probably most effectively because sin steals life. It separates us from God. In fact, in John chapter 10, verse 10, this is, a, this is a passage worth memorizing. If you just jot this down, John 10, verse 10, in the first half of the verse, it says the thief. Now, when it's talking about the thief, remember who the thief is, right? The thief is the devil. The thief is who in the Garden of Eden appeared in the form of a serpent to tempt Adam and Eve. He, he wanted to bring sin into the world, and he continues to promote sin. Goes around like a roaring lion trying to figure out how he can devour us by drawing us into sin and drawing us away from God. And so it says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. See, the devil knows sin. He invented sin. And he understands exactly what it does. He knows that it steals and it kills and it destroys. And that's what he's thriving on. That's what he wants to bring into our lives. In fact, it's interesting. So the the funeral for President Bush that I talked about, it it was a a beautiful service, amazing uh, testimonies about his life, about the fact that he was a great man and a good man, the beautiful music. But just when all is said and done, it's still a funeral. It's a testament to the fact that even though this man was great and this man was good, he was also dead. In Romans chapter 3, the Holy Spirit inspires the Apostle Paul to write these words. The wages of sin is, the wages of sin is death. Sin always steals hope. So what do we do? Well, dear friends, it brings us back to John 10, verse 10, because remember I just read the first half of that verse? But there's another half. So it begins, the thief, the devil, comes to steal and kill and destroy. He's got an agenda, and he's good at his agenda, and he loves to steal joy and peace and hope. But the verse goes on. But I, Jesus said... I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Point number three this morning, Jesus pays our debt. I love this passage in Colossians chapter 1. God has rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son whom he loves. His son paid the price to free us. Jesus paid our debt to set us free, which means that our sins are forgiven. 
That God sent his son to do what we could not do for ourselves. You know, it makes me think back. I mentioned to the congregation last weekend, I've been here 17 years now. As of Thanksgiving weekend, 17 years. And man, the changes that have happened just in that time. Changes as we, as we look out up and down 1604. I mean, whole neighborhoods and shopping centers that didn't exist. Neighborhoods that didn't exist. You know, I think about the, the changes in our congregation. This building didn't exist. Look at my kids. You know, my, my baby girl is going to get married on March 15th. When we came, she was in kindergarten. And if none of that brings to home the, the reality of the time that's passed, all I have to do is look in the mirror, right? <laughs> but when I think back to those early days, you know, our congregation was going through a very difficult and painful time. And financially, we were strapped. There were times where we could not meet our payroll, and there were times when we couldn't pay utilities or other kinds of bills that we had. And during those times, there were, there were people, families in our congregation, who stepped up and, and made sacrificial, enormous kinds of gifts to sustain the congregation through those periods of time. And you may say, well, I don't even know who they are. Exactly. Those people made those gifts not to be known or not to, to be thought of as, as some kind of altruistic heroes. Those people made those gifts because they love God and they love the congregation. And so what they did was, was to alleviate that debt, to alleviate that burden. Do you understand, on a much bigger scale, in a way that makes those gifts pale in comparison, that's what God has done for us. In fact, that, that passage that's so well known by so many people, John 3.16, speaks about that. That God did what he did because of his love for you and me. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not be crushed under the debt, under the burden of their sin. They shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, dear friends, I don't know what you can afford this Christmas season, but I know what God can afford. God can afford to erase your spiritual debt. God can afford to take every burden that is, that is crushing you and he can, he can lift you up. He can make this season light. God can afford to restore your joy he can afford to restore your peace. He can afford to restore your hope because he can afford through his resurrected son Jesus, through his cross, through his death, and through his resurrection, God can restore your life. And that's why this season, this Christmas, can be light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you don't leave us crushed and burdened and hopeless you restore us. You restore to us the joy of our salvation. You bring us hope and life and light. You lead us in paths of righteousness. Heavenly Father, walk with us today. Strengthen us and build us up that we might be your witnesses wherever we go, that we might share the hope of Christmas light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen.